very much. I am so happy to be here today. And I have to kind of stand tall here because <laughs> the podium is almost taller than I am. But I'll probably be walking around a little bit out here in front so I can share with you some of the displays that I have. I am the manager of recreation and volunteer services at the Veterans Home. And this spring, I'll have worked there 23 years which seems like a long time. And then everybody always starts to decide, well, let's see, how old would that make her? <laughs> I always say, well, I was born there, but that's not really true. <laughs> at any rate, there is a wealth of history at the Veterans Home, and I just have the tip of the iceberg here with me today. And I'm sure there's a lot of you here in the crowd that probably have some wonderful stories that you could share as well about this topic. Uh, first of all, a lot of you don't necessarily even refer to this building as the Veterans Home. Most of you in this audience probably heard of it as being called the Soldiers and Sailors Home. Yes, I see a lot of nods. And to this day, I still have a lot of people that would say, oh, are, are you working at the Soldiers and Sailors Home or at the hospital? And that's how they decide which, which facility it is that I, that I work at. I really want to begin the presentation today by quoting an excerpt from a wonderful speech given by a fantastic individual. The individual's name was President Abraham Lincoln, and it was his second inaugural speech. And this is how it goes. As the nation braced itself for the final throes of the Civil War, thousands of spectators gathered on a muddy Pennsylvania Avenue near the U.S. Capitol to hear President Lincoln's second inaugural address. It was March 4th, 1865, a time of great uneasiness. Just over one month, the war would end. The president would be assassinated. President Lincoln framed his speech on the moral and religious implications of the war, rhetorically questioning how a just God could unleash such a terrible war upon the nation. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses in the providence of God, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offenses came. With its deep philosophical insights, critics have hailed the speech as one of Lincoln's best. As the speech progressed, President Lincoln turned from the divisive bitterness at the war's roots to the unifying task of reconciliation and reconstruction. In the speech's final paragraph, the president delivered his prescription for the na nation's recovery. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive, to, strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. That was President Abraham Lincoln's final words of his second inaugural address, March 4th, 1865. Now if you visit any veterans home or veterans hospital, you are likely to see President Abraham, Abraham Lincoln's words up on the wall. And it says, to care for him who shall have borne the battle. That is the charge that he gave to the nation a month prior to his death. And he took the, the seriousness of being the president very much to heart during this horrible time in our nation's history. He was known to really care deeply for the common soldier. He really wanted to make a difference in the lives of those common soldiers, and he routinely spent time at the soldiers' home grounds in Washington, D.C., where he has a cottage, and it's now being restored um, by historical societies across the nation. And that is where he actually wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, was when he was on the soldier's home grounds. But he was really a, a people person. He wanted to touch the lives of those soldiers. And he called those soldiers his boys. That's how he rever referenced them. And when the soldiers referenced President Lincoln, they referenced him as Father Abraham. That was how they referred to him. So there was a really deep bond. And he was quoted as saying, 
This extraordinary war in which we are engaged falls heavily upon all classes of people, but the most heavily upon the soldier. For it has been said, all that a man hath will be, will be give for his life. And while all contribute of their substance, the soldier puts his life at stake and often yields it up in his country's cause. The highest merit, then, is due to the soldier. And he was often, you know, somewhat ridiculed by some of those uh, politicians at the time who felt that he shouldn't be wasting his time visiting the soldiers on the home front or going to the soldiers' home in Washington, D.C. And most certainly when there was a big gathering of people, he should be taking care of the dignitaries, those other political animals in Washington, D.C. And that was not in his heart. His heart was with the soldier. And there's a story where he was having a big gathering and there were so many people and it was very packed. And it got to the point where he couldn't shake everyone's hands any longer because it was just so packed and they were trying to get him where he needed to be to address the group. And so finally, he decided to just kind of acknowledge all the dignitaries, the senators and all the political dignitaries and the, whoever else was the big wigs of the time. And he just kind of bowed to them and acknowledged that, you know, there you are and I can't get over you, to you to shake your hand. But Finally, he observed that a wounded soldier entered with his poorly clad mother, and he hastily left his position and went over to them, and he crowded his way through so that he could reach that wounded soldier and his mother. And he reached out a hand, and he shook the hands and congratulated the woman for having so patriotic a son, and also expressed his sympathy for the son in his disabled condition. And it was affecting demonstration that brought tears to the eyes of many spectators. For this president simply acted what he had said again and again and again. The highest merit is due to the soldier. All who witnessed the hearty greeting were satisfied that Mr. Lincoln meant what he said. And because of, of his conviction that it was so important to take care of the wounded soldiers and later, you know, because of the age of soldiers, he was a big supporter of the soldiers' home there in Washington, D.C. And soon after the Civil War was over and, and the soldiers all went back to their home states, other soldiers' homes started to spring up here and there. And it was very interesting because a man from Grand Island who worked for the Union Pacific Railroad by the name of Samuel Bean Jones visited a soldier's home in Massachusetts. And he was very excited about that. And he thought, you know, we really need that in Nebraska. And since he was from Grand Island, he wanted it here in this community. So he came back to Nebraska and he decided to uh, contact those people that were involved with the Grand Army of the Republic. Some of you have heard of the GAR, I'm sure. They were very instrumental in the state as well as here in Grand Island. And he brought this idea of having a soldier's home come to Nebraska. And General John Thayer was the department commander of the GAR. And he also became very interested and assisted in carrying out some of the preliminary work to get that done. And so, in 1887, on January 4th, uh, there is an excerpt here that I've taken from the Senate Journal of the Nebraska Legislature. And it was a resolution, and it said, Whereas there are many old soldiers in Nebraska who, from wounds or disabilities received while in the Union Army during the rebellion, are in the county poorhouses of this state, therefore be it resolved that it is the sense of this Senate that a suitable building be erected and grounds provided for the care and comfort of the old soldiers of Nebraska in their declining years. Resolved that a committee of five be appointed to confer with a committee of the House on indigent soldiers and Marines to take such action as would look to the establishment of a state soldier's home. And from that, the legislative bill 247 was drafted and passed on March 4, 1887. And that was accomplished through the unceasing work and effort by Charles Reef, House Representative, and Samuel Walback, State Senator, both from Grand Island. Now this bill stipulated that 640 acres of land be donated for the construction of said soldier's home. And the city of Grand Island wanted to have that 
home located here. So efforts began immediately to try to raise the money to get the pledges so that they could have that land purchased here near Grand Island. And it was quite an effort. And it was very difficult for them to get it raised because some people were like, well, yeah, that'd be okay, but you know, digging into your pocket, that was a different matter. Finally, they had a meeting on March 31st, 1887 at the Barton Bach Opera House. And at that meeting, they said to all the, the city founders, they said, we have got to have money to purchase this land. And within a 36 hour period, they had the $25,600 necessary to purchase land three miles north <laughs> of Grand Island. And that was where the Soldiers and Sailors Home came t into existence. And we do have in our, in our history, a history book that was put together uh, for the centennial year. And what we did is we tried to pull together some of the information that we had that we found in storage. Unfortunately, because of natural disasters such as the 67 flood and the 1980 tornado, we lost tons of records, tons of photos. And so what I brought here today are things that are just really basically represent the majority of what we have. We do not have a lot of photos, we do not have a lot of ledger books like I brought here because they were destroyed through natural disaster. But some of the employees, myself included, tried to pull together what we could from the information that we had about the 100 years of history. And we had, at that time, found an excerpt from the Grand Island, well, I don't know if it was called the Grand Island Independent, maybe Harold Ritter could tell us that, but at any rate, <laughs> they get credit for it in our book, um, that there was an article on April 9, 1887, that referenced this historic meeting that was taking place in the, in the town. And it reads, even since the passage of what we know as the Soldiers' Home Bill, the Board of Trade has had a committee actively at work among the citizens of Grand Island and immediate vicinity soliciting subscriptors for the purchase of a site for the same, consisting of a whole section of land. It is well known that a section of land lying as close to the city as the law provides for the location of the home would cost considerable money. And it would be no small matter to raise the required amount. And indeed, it has seemed at times as though the property owners and businessmen didn't care whether the land was secured or not. Over 80 lists were placed in the hands of different men who have faithfully devoted their time to it for the past three weeks. The committee did well, but somehow could not create the enthusiasm which was needed to obtain the full amount. And a mass meeting was held at the Opera House on Thursday evening at which the liberality of the community showed itself and amounts which had before been subscribed were doubled and many of them more than doubled. It is a hard matter to get the list in shape correctly and there will be no doubt errors which we will cheerfully be corrected upon the error being made known. See the great public relations the Independent already had then. They knew they were going to get it messed up but they were already apologizing for it. <laughs> Sorry you guys. At any rate, this list that we took from, from that list that we obtained is in our, in our our history book and it's really an interesting list and you know we just took it from the record so we hope that the independent had it right but you know it went anywhere from five dollars to a hundred dollars to two thousand dollars that people pledged so that they could purchase that land so that the soldiers and sailors home could indeed be located in Grand Island so if any of you have roots in Grand Island and have people that you, you know, your ancestors or your whoever, your real relatives, you might find some names in here and I'll have some of these extra books up here for you sure to take a look at. So the, the home was established. What happened next? Well, construction had to begin, of course. And I see we have an architect in our midst, Marvin Webb's here today. Well, the architect that was in charge of this structure was Julius Furman. And he, he designed the building and, um, let me grab it here. This is the main original structure, this one right here. And it was designed by Julius Furman, as I noted, and the cornerstone was, was laid October 20th, 1887, and it was, um, yeah, you can be Vanna White, how's that sound? <laughs> He's going to be my Vanna White. <laughs> um, 
The cornerstone was, was laid in October of 1887, and by then John Thayer was the governor of Nebraska, so he was instrumental all the way through. And it was, it was actually, it cost uh, $45,000 for the construction of this particular facility. And then in 1896, there was an addition. This is the addition right here. And the addition was a cost of $12,000. And that addition was named in honor of President Abraham Lincoln. So it was often referenced as the Lincoln Building. So oftentimes when people see this picture, they think the entire thing is the Lincoln Building. And, and to our knowledge, there really was no name other than the Soldiers and Sailors Home for the original structure. And then the Lincoln Building was, uh, was created some years later. And then everybody started referring to the whole structure as the Lincoln Building. Thank you. Sure. You want to? <laughs> and if you look up here, whoops. If you look here at, and some of you, when you come up later, if you want to look, there is a photo of our Civil War veterans on the porch of the Lincoln Building. So that's what this particular photo is. Um, this is our, at the turn of the century, but it also said there's some Spanish-American War veterans in this photo as well. But those are all people lined up there on the porches of that particular building. Yeah, I probably won't be able to get that back up now. Nope. That's right. Now the eligibility requirements have of course changed some during the over the years, but basically the eligibility to live at the Soldiers and Sailors Home was very simple. You had to have served at that time to, in the Civil War. Um, now it's just during an active period of war you had to have served. And you had to have lived in the state of Nebraska two years sometime during the course of your life. So if you've resided in Nebraska for two years sometime during the course of your life and served during an active period of war, you're eligible to live at the veterans home currently. Um, we also have wives and widows of veterans that reside at our facility and did at that time. And I'm not sure when it happened, but at some point Gold Star fathers and mothers became eligible to also live at our facility. So those who have lost a son or a daughter in a war period are eligible to live at the veterans home. Now, when we for, if you still look at that picture and you think, well, look at all those handsome young men. What were they doing at the Soldiers and Sailors Home? Well, when we first opened, we took care of what we now call the walking wounded. The walking wounded were those people who survived the Civil War and maybe survived some minor injury because the vast majority of people that were injured in the Civil War did not live long. They usually got infection and gangrene would set in and then they would eventually die a uh, quite painful death. So the Civil War did not really produce the casualties that lived any length of time. But what they did produce was a lot of folks who now we know were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, mental health illness, um, alcohol addiction, and some drug addiction issues as in relation to their service. So we call them the walking wounded because a lot of people look at those folks and say, well, they look physically very capable of, of getting around. Why are they even residing there? And it was because in those days, we, they didn't know how to take care of mental health issues. And so they couldn't keep a job, and they were indigent, and they were in the county poorhouses. And so they were designated then as being eligible to be in the soldiers and sailors home. Now, I know that a lot of you, being your history buffs, know that Grand Island being a railroad town, as we hear the train go back and forth several times during this presentation, a railroad town was kind of a wild town. And from what I read, I mean, it was pretty wild. <laughs> and different stories I hear uh, tell us about how wild Grand Island was, and actually, I think some of the original members of the vets or the soldiers and sailors home contributed a little bit to that reputation <laughs> because they were admitted to the home they were not committed this was not an institution that they were locked in they could come and go as they saw fit and they went a lot 
and in those days they had street cars and so they would come downtown and visit the taverns and visit the brothels and then they'd go back and get in big trouble because they'd be intoxicated and causing trouble and fighting and using profanity and uh, you know that was kind of a, a reputation that the soldiers in Sailor Holmes got was you know a bunch of old alcoholics out there raising cane and so <laughs> at any rate um, they would also in fact uh, someone was sharing with me a story that uh, not only did they come into town to visit some of the brothels, but sometimes those ladies of ill repute would jump on board the, the streetcar and go out to the soldiers' home and try to sneak in. So <laughs> there was apparently a, a lot of interesting stories back in those days. And do I have any real hard evidence of it? Yes. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> One of the few things that did survive was some of our discharge records. So let me grab the book and I'll share with you some of the reasons why people were discharged from the Soldiers and Sailors Home. This was the early 1900s. It's a heavy book. <laughs> As you can see, they would record the person's name and date and why they were discharged. And so you can, after the program, if I'll set it over at one of these tables and you guys can pour through it. And it's pretty interesting, and I didn't have time to go through it to a great degree. Intoxication and being verbally abusive was listed quite frequently. <laughs> um, but also, there's one here where it says, uh, fighting and cutting and attempting to kill a comrade with a knife. That got him thrown out. Um, insubordination, writing disrespectful letter to the governor. Don't be writing the governor, or you're gonna get discharged. Um, I like this one. I always show this one to my boss, the administrator. Criticism of the management. <laughs> I'm going to take that to the member council and say, you guys better watch it. You're going to get discharged. <laughs> and, of course, there was a lot of fighting going on different times. Um, one of the, and, and, and there's even one in here that talks about how somebody was uh, assaulted the streetcar driver and you know tried to kill him or something and so he got discharged and then this one I thought was really interesting they have one in here where uh, two members here that I found were discharged because when uh, President McKinley was assassinated they expressed satisfaction uh -oh. and so they got thrown out of the home <laughs> so this is really kind of an interesting record and it does kind of show that the type of people we took care of then you know really are vastly different than the type of people in the type of, of uh, life we lead today but um, certainly after the program I'll have it sitting out so that you folks can take a look at it I thought it was interesting that of all things that were salvaged from the natural disasters, we have that particular ledger book that was, was kept over time. Um, in the early years of the home, able-bodied members were expected to work. So, you know, they might help with the farm or with maintenance or with housekeeping or, or you know, making the beds or, you know, whatever. And there was a lot of our income was generated by the farm because we actually had a real working farm in those days. And unfortunately, I know we have some farm pictures, but I, I just couldn't lay my hands on them this week when I was trying to pull stuff together. But I do have some interesting facts that were pulled together again in our, in our history book about the farm. And so I want to share just briefly a little bit about that. In 1887, the home's pasture land was rented for cash and the money received was used by the various funds maintained by the home. By 1889, monies received from the farm and gardens were divided into several funds, such as cottage, stock and implement, boiler room, hospital, sewerage, officer's salary, furniture, paints, oil, fuel, light, road grading, and a drug and instrument fund for the hospital. Later, the farm grounds were rented out on a crop share basis to feed cattle, hogs, and chickens, all raised by the home. Although enough livestock and garden produce was raised to supply the home's needs, it was sold at a higher price and repurchased at a lower price, which I find really weird, but whatever, I guess it worked. Around 1903, it was recommended by the Visiting and Examining Board that the home butcher their own meat. Holstein dairy cows maintained by the farm supplied the milk and cream needed. The farm was supervised by a farm manager and often was worked by parolees from the state prison and even patients from the Beatrice State Hospital. 
So we've had a connection with that hospital for a number of years also. The cost of items in the early operation years of the home seem inexpensive now. However, at that time, they were reasonable costs considering the economy at the time. In late 1988, the home bought its first spring wagon for transportation for $95. A funeral and coffin for a member cost $18. The bedding purchased for the Lincoln Building cost $7 per iron cot, $2.50 per mattress, $0.70 cents per pillow, and $2 per blanket. In 1901, the home bought 276 yards of calico at $13.80 and 134 yards of cotton batting at $13.40. And from this raw material, the women members of the home made 134 quilts. So as you can see, in those days, because they were more able-bodied, they were required to help out, whether it be help with the chickens or help with the quilts or whatever the case may be. They were, they were expected to help with that. And some members did come and go a lot, and they could get furloughs or passes. On occasion, they would just leave. And those people are called fence jumpers. The, it's listed in this discharge book a lot. A lot of people were discharged for being fence jumpers, which meant they just left without telling anybody they were discharging. And often they were accused of theft because the home would issue them clothing. They had to wear what the home issued. And when they would jump the fence, they would take that clothing with them and then they would be labeled as thieves as well because they would have walked out with those clothes that they had on their back. Um, when they would die, uh, the memorial cemetery was set up, and I know that Virginia and Dick Good are really working hard on, uh, on trying to get all of our um, information together on that cemetery so that we can really find them. We're putting together a directory so we can see where everybody was laid to rest. Um, so they couldn't, and currently they still are buried there if they choose to, to have their burial there. And I found it kind of interesting. I went through some of our other books because I, I knew I couldn't bring them all. But I thought it was interesting to see, so what did people die of back then? You know, how did they, because it listed in the books, you know, Joe Blow and then the date of his death. And then it would list if they knew um, what was the cause of death. And so in uh, one of the books I looked through from 1911 to 1914, here are some of the things that were routinely, I didn't pick out everything, but I just picked out the things that I kept seeing over and over again in that time period from 1911 to 1914. One of the things that was always listed, oh, I mean really routinely, old age. <laughs> they just died and it was old age, so that was all they cared and that's what they called it. Um, Another one that kind of startled me when I first saw it, and then when I realized the time period, um, they listed insanity as the cause of death. And that was because in those days they hadn't quite learned what went on with people's brains as they aged, and they didn't under know or label senile dementia. And so when people started exhibiting signs of, of uh, Alzheimer's or other signs and symptoms of dementia, they called them insane. And so that's how they listed that they died of insanity. So I hope that if people ever look back into those records and are trying to find great-great-grandpa and they see that he died of insanity, it wasn't necessarily that he suffered from mental illness. It was because that was what they called it back then. Uh, the other things, and some of you might know what these things are. I am young enough that I do not. <laughs> that apoplexy, consumption, dropsy, uh, nervous prostration, uh, pneumonia, heart failure, acute indigestion, <laughs> and then unfortunately listed many times was suicide. We had a lot of folks that committed suicide over the years. And of course now with the mental health growth we are able to do interventions to help our, our veterans that are depressed and, and, and really need the help. Um, but I have worked there 23 years and I have seen suicides. But fortunately, because of the caring staff and, and professionals that we have on hand, we are able to have interventions and help those people get through those rough spots. By 1926, I noticed that they started with a little uh, more scientific names. Arterial sclerosis was listed a lot, uh, as was senile dementia. You didn't see the insanity listed anymore. It was now listed as senile dementia. 
And then I kind of flipped forward just to see if anything else popped out at me. And one of the things that popped out at me was in 1939 and 1940, it must have been a really rough year in Nebraska because influenza was listed many, many times in our death records. So I don't know if the whole community had that or if that ended up being something where you know they might have had to quarantine out at the soldiers and sailors home. But anytime you have communal living, you have one person with influenza, you're going to have a whole ward with influenza, and especially in those days where they didn't have any real good way to treat that. So those were kind of the interesting facts that I found in one of our ledger books about causes of death. Now, there was a lot of buildings that were built in addition to the regular building there that we showed you. Uh, in 1888, the other buildings that were listed were a powerhouse, commissary building, ice house, conservatory, conservatory, implement house, band shell, recreation hall, carpenter shop, cow barn, horse stables, and stock sheds. The Garfield building was completed in 1889 and had a 36 bed capacity. <clears throat> it was used to house widows of veterans. <clears throat> so that was the first time they had separate housing for the widows. And then some of you, those of you that have driven past our facility have seen our beautiful lake. And that lake area has really enjoyed a long history. Um, it's listed that it was constructed to the north and used for raising game fish, and it also provided ice, which was used during summer months in the commissary to keep all the foodstuffs cold. So it kind of was a dual function. It was for the fishing, but it was also for harvesting the ice for use in the summer. And then we had our own post office, and a lot of you might recognize the word or the address, Burkett Station. And for years, that was our address, and we still get mail and apparently the local post office knows enough to know that if it's labeled Burkett Station that it belongs to the Grand Island Vets Home because we still get mail that lists us as the Burkett Station. And uh, the original post office was established in 1903 and John Staley was the first postmaster and in 1906 it was named the Burkett Post Office in honor of the U.S. Senator Elmer Burkett of Nebraska in appreciation for all the work that he did for veterans. And it was originally a railroad designation located on the Union Pacific tracks. And in 1927, a building was built that actually housed the post office. And that building still stands today. It's one of the older buildings on our campus. Um, it, it also held the canteen and the adjutant's quarters in those days. Uh, today, that's where our human resources is located. It's not a building where we can um, actually have members get to easily because it's not connected uh, with an internal hallway. Uh, then we came to the McKinley Building, and the McKinley Building still stands today. It was completed in 1910, and let me grab the picture here of that. Hmm. This is the McKinley Building. And it still is on our campus. We currently do not have any people that reside in that building. A couple years ago, we closed that building. We put a lot of money into that building uh, because of its age. It had a lot of issues. Uh, but it was our domiciliary building. And that was where our assisted living folks lived at uh, one time. But when it was a first uh, built, it had a 35-bed capacity for single veterans. It also housed a library and a recreational area for the members of the home. And the other thing that I found interesting when I was looking at the history of our home was that we did have some records about the wages that people earned. And so I did pull up the payroll information and what they did is they have a big book like these and they would list the, the title of the job and then they'd list the name, uh, you know, and how much it was that they were paying them for that month. And then it would, you know, they'd have to sign the book saying they got paid. And so you have all these signatures of various people. And when I went through it, I, I found something really I thought was hilarious. Does anybody, would anybody like to venture to guess who was the highest paid person at the Soldiers and Sailors Home in 1911? Which position? You are so right on. Guess what? It was the chief cook. The chief cook got 75 bucks a month. As compared to the sergeant major, the boss, 20 bucks a month. <laughs> so I'll tell you, over time, nothing's changed. <laughs> what is the most important thing to everyone? Food. 
What is the most important position? The person that cooks the food. <laughs> and we've had a long history of people who either really liked the food or really hated the food. And if they hate the food, they hate everything about the home. And if they like the food, they like everything about the home. Because you see, you have three times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, to either get it right or get it wrong. <laughs> so that I found was very interesting. The cheap cook got $75 a month. The cook and dishwasher, that was a combined position, got $55 a month. They were the highest paid. The next highest paid was the head nurse. She made $50 a month. And the regular nurses made half that. They made $25 a month. Now we also had to employ a day fireman and a night fireman at $45 and $40 a month because of the way the, that we, uh, the coal and all that, that, that heated our buildings. And then we had a lot of people like the dairyman, the farmhand, uh, the nurse, as I said before, they all made $25 a month. We had a florist and a driver and a janitor that made $20 a month. The, the person that made the least amount, I can't believe this, the butcher made $15 a month. I think that was awful hard work for $15 a month. And I don't know if these people worked, you know, eight hours a day, you know, five days a week, or if they just worked part time. I don't, it doesn't show the hours. Um, the, the person that made the least amount of money was the librarian, $3 a month. <laughs> Again, that might have been a part time position, but I found it really interesting that the chief cook, and I immediately went to the administrator on that one too, and I said, you know, I think somebody in this facility is way overpaid, and I think we should re reevaluate it. But he just laughed, and, and I don't think anything's going to change. <laughs> um, one of the things that is inherent in working in a state facility is bureaucracy. <laughs> and you know, we seem to think that bureaucracy is a modern day function, but it wasn't. In the records that I found, uh, bureaucracy was alive and well way back in the early days of the home. We had what was called the Board of Commissioners of State Institutions. That sounds really important. And later their letterhead was just shortened and it said Board of Control. Yes, they like to control things. Nothing's changed. It's still the same today, but they love to control things. And the most minute routine things were being controlled. And I have another book here, and I'm going to pull it up here and read you one of the passages. They, they really took their job seriously in Lincoln, making sure that things were being operated correctly at the soldier's home. Oh, this one's really heavy. I was going to just bring the copy of the paper, but I thought you guys might want to really look at this before you leave today. I'm not sure why somebody took the time and energy to put this all together. Um, what they did is they took a bunch of different pi of, of copies of letters and stuck them in this book, and so I was kind of going through them. Here's a letter that was dated in 1917 to the Commandant of the Soldiers and Sailors Home. This letter does not apply to anyone except those guilty of neglect, as indicated. Now, you know, when you work at a nursing home, you think, neglect? Oh, my God. No, that's not what he's talking about. It has been observed at several of the state institutions that electric lights are permitted to burn continuously in some instances and at other times when they should be dispensed with. Each superintendent must take steps at once to see that all lights are turned out throughout his institution when not needed. Each superintendent is also instructed to see that gas, where it is used for cooking, is turned off when there is no for further use for it. This is along the lines of proper economy and the cooperation of each superintendent is expected. No reply to this letter is necessarily. Merely act. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. We are already, you know, being accused of neglect by not taking our stewardship very seriously in terms of how we are taking care of the budget, which seemed to be the most important thing. Now, 
The other thing that I found was kind of interesting was written in 1926, and then there were several letters several years later that kind of uh, referenced the same thing. And it says, the following general orders in reference to Christmas has been uh, issued by the board. This is the board of control. The board will order oranges and celery for the various institutions to, to arrive in plenty of time for Christmas. Where an institution had chicken on Thanksgiving, a pork or other dinner will be served at Christmas. So, you know, you don't get to decide your menu, we're going to decide that for you. And where chickens were not used on Thanksgiving, they may be had for Christmas unless the institution raised enough of their own for both occasions. So, eh, you know, if you did raise it, I guess we'll let you have chicken twice. Number three, no oysters and no cranberries will be purchased. There, uh, let's see, there, where an institution makes arrangements for a Christmas tree, it must be bought locally and the sum of not over $10 to be expended at each institution for tree and trimmings. And successful bidders on candy and nuts have been asked to ship promptly without waiting for orders. All estimates as the Christmas buying will be returned in accordance with the above. And then it says, P.S. Board will order 350 cigars. <laughs> okay, well, let me grab this. <laughs> this, the reason I brought these pictures, and again, because of the size of the crowd, you'll have to come up and look at these, but this is a picture of a Thanksgiving dinner at the Soldiers and Sailors' Home. And someone, I don't know if they attended an auction or something, and in the bottom of the box, here was this picture, and on the back of it, it said, you know, Thanksgiving dinner at the Soldiers and Sailors' Home. And then they also had, with that, and this was in 1907, Nebraska Soldiers and Sailors' Home, Grand Island, Nebraska, Thanksgiving, November 28, 1907. And it lists the menu that was served for breakfast and dinner and supper. And so we got those matted and framed together because it was just so interesting. And here they did have chicken, that infamous chicken, they did have on Thanksgiving, along with coleslaw and cranberry sauce, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes, creamed onions, pumpkin pie, mince pie, cheese, pickles, apples, and bananas. Now the reason I found it funny about this it, this one part of this letter where it says that they were not going to order oysters or cranberries. Well, either people must have either got mad about that or else the cost of those things came down. I'm not sure which. But in 1927, there was another one about it, and it says, number one, the board will order oysters, cranberries, celery, <laughs> etc., and it goes on and, ex and explains that further. So I thought that was kind of interesting that either people must have rebelled at that or the cost of those items must have changed because they were adamant they couldn't have them for the one meal. Well, the facility started to grow as time progressed, and in 1923, the Pershing Building was erected at a cost of $200,000 and was named after General John Pershing, and a $40,000 addition was added to the South End in 1928. And the Pershing Building, you can see there, is the building that has the white columns, the three-story building with the white columns. That is the Pershing Building. And it was often referenced as the Pershing Hospital. Um, they were very proud of the fact that that was their hospital, and in the front, on, the, on the bottom floor was the dining room, and that's like where the library and stuff is located now, but the, the, the bottom level was the dining room, and then after that, uh, second and third floors were large barracks, and they just, you know, they just lined beds up. It's like a big hospital ward, and they just lined beds up, and they housed like 104 veterans in that Pershing hospital. And that's how they lived, was in those beds lined up, I don't know, 30 or 40 in each big room. So um, that was a, a big step towards modernization, so as they saw it. And then the administration building was completed in 1931. And the administration building, the administration building replaced this original structure. And we have pictures up here of the administration building on the far end here. And really, 
we, do, we, only, we never have found photos of what it looked like when they tore this down because they left the Lincoln Building up. And after the show today, if you want to come up and look, I have a little teeny postcard that someone at some point donated to us, and it shows the administration building at, that's still attached to the old Lincoln Building, and that's the only, only photo I've ever seen in all the years of my working there. Um, and perhaps Stir Museum or somebody might have some other photos, but that's, that was really quite a find when somebody donated a postcard to us that showed it together. Thank you. <laughs> and the first floor was used for the Commandant's apartments and for some offices. And then there was some other general construction about that time. By 1937, additional construction, construction included a cellar and storage rooms, commissary with a cold stage area, cement oil power plant, or excuse me, cement oil house, machine shed, three garages, and a greenhouse. And then with the construction of a new power plant and the addition of boilers, a whistle was installed. Does anybody here remember the whistle? Apparently in Grand Island at that time, they would re we would release the steam from that whistle at certain times. I don't know if it was like at noon and at six or nine or whatever. And that was how the citizens of Grand Island knew what time it was because of the whistle that was blown from releasing the steam from the Soldiers and Sailors Home boiler plant. And also it was used as a, a warning system for tornadoes because, again, Nebraska is notorious for tornadoes, and so it would blow its whistle if there was a tornado sighted. Um, in 1951, the Assembly Hall, which is now known as the Auditorium, was built, and so that structure has been around a long time, and that's where we have a lot of programming activities. At that time, it was also used for uh, church services. And then we became, came into the era of tremendous growth. And just real briefly, I'll explain to you how that happened. Um, obviously, the, the people saw that after World War II, there was going to be a great influx of, of people that were going to be in need of our facility. And the, the medical field had grown by leaps and bounds. And so people that used to have a stroke and die had a stroke and lived. And some were able to rehab and go back home and some could not. And so pretty soon we were keeping people alive longer and longer with medical technology, but sometimes they were disabled to the point where they could no longer live in their own homes. So they were starting to see a need for more skilled nursing care. So what they did in 1955, there was a legislative act that allowed the Soldiers and Sailors Home to actually charge a fee to those who could pay some fee towards their care. And what they did with that money then was put it into a member fund that they could then use later for construction of other buildings. So 10 years later, in 1965, the Garfield Building was torn down and the Anderson Building was built. And this building cost $300,000 and it was constructed entirely from what was known as the membership fund. That was really how they put it together and were able to build that. At the same time, that same year, the World War I Memorial Building was constructed. Now a lot of people don't know there is such a thing as the World War I Memorial Building, and I bet some of the staff at the Vets Home don't even know that there's a World War I Memorial Building, but I can tell you, most of you will recognize it when I tell you it's the building that houses our wood shop and our ceramic shop where our occupational therapy department resides. And a lot of people recognized that, but they didn't know that it was called the World War I Memorial Building, and it was built with that membership fund. And at this time, um, Gerald has some postcards that she's going to hand out to folks, so if everybody would just like to take a postcard and pass them around. Gerald, why don't you just hand them and then a big stack and let them just pass them around, maybe. And we'll come around on the other side. At this time, um, we, they, they saw again there was going to be even more need for skilled nursing care. And, and unfortunately, when the state saw what a great thing this was to have all this money coming into the membership fund, they're like, well, maybe we shouldn't have to fund you so much money. Maybe you could use that money that you get from the people that live there towards the cost of their care. So all of a sudden, we didn't get to put it in the construction fund anymore. Now we had to use it to offset what the state wasn't going to provide to us anymore. So then we thought, well, how are we going to go about constructing more buildings? And so what they did was the VA administration and the Veterans Administration, of course, is a federal 
funded program and they have what's called the VA Construction Grant Fund. And the VA Construction Grant Fund, basically what it does is it, it supplies 65% of the funding cost of a new building or for renovations. And 35% of the cost of that would have to come then from the state legislature. They have to say, yes, we're going to give 35% of the cost of this. So at that time, we applied for that and we were able to construct the World War II Memorial Building that's depicted on these postcards. There's two different shots of it and these postcards are yours to keep. Um, that's part of our historical record. They purchased a lot of these postcards over the years and used to sell them in our canteen and when they were cleaning out the canteen and getting ready to move into their new spot, the foxhole with our current construction, she came up upon, she discovered boxes and boxes of thousands of these postcards and she was like, well it doesn't really look like this anymore. What are we going to do with them? And she was going to toss them and I said, no, don't throw those away. So I snagged them and so the keeper of all things, that's me. <laughs> so I thought, well you guys might enjoy having a, a postcard. Those, that would have been dated back in the 60s when that was built. Uh, December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, 1968 was the day that that uh, was constructed. And then about that time in 1969, the state said, well, you know, the Soldiers and Sailors Home doesn't really describe who lives in this Soldiers and Sailors Home because it's not just soldiers and sailors that we're leaving out all the other branches of the military. So in 1969, that was when they, they called it the uh, Nebraska Veterans Home. And about that same time, they were also putting in for this other skilled nursing facility that was called the Phillips Building eventually. And on the first floor of that, they wanted to construct a chapel. Now this is kind of a sad part of our history in Nebraska because when they submitted the plan to build the second and third floors of Phillips and then the chapel on the first floor, the, the legislation, the legislators in their wisdom said, separation of church and state. We don't have to construct a chapel for our veterans. Well, of course, <laughs> that was not well received by anyone, especially our veterans organizations. And they said, fine, we will have a chapel because if it wasn't for our veterans, we wouldn't have the freedom to pursue our religious beliefs. And therefore, it seems quite uh, unfortunate that the folks that live in the state penitentiary have a chapel, but the people that live at the veterans home don't. And so this really grew in furor, and they said, we will just raise the money, and we will get it done. And in three years, they raised $90,000, and the All Faiths Chapel was constructed. And currently, we do not use state funds for the operation of that chapel. The donated money we get and the um, canteen, the foxhole profits, go into what's called the Members Amusement and Activity Fund. And that's how we buy things like the wine or the grape juice and the wafers and the hymnals and etc. for that chapel. In addition to the Grand Island campus, the state decided to expand out to other areas. And so some of you are aware that there are other veterans homes in the state. They're all part of our system. In 1963, the Norfolk Veterans Home was established. In 1975, Scotts Bluff got a veterans home. And in 1980, Omaha got a veterans home. So they're all part of the veterans home system. They're much smaller than our facility. They have about 100 to 140 people that reside at their facilities, where ours, ours you know, can take care of about 300. And just getting close to the end here, we did have, uh, of course, a lot of our photos and stuff I told you that were lost in the tornado. But there was some information left about how we operated in the face of that disaster. Because unlike many places, we remained open. We provided the care to our veterans in spite of all the damage that was received. And again, I'm going to just read a brief excerpt here from our history book. On Tuesday, June 3rd, 1980, at approximately 8.45 p.m., the first of seven tornadoes that would wreak havoc and despair for two and three quarters hours was sighted in northwest Grand Island. 
This tornado system caused $425,000 worth of damage to the Nebraska veterans' home. There was an additional expense of approximately $13,000 paid in double-time wages for employees to maintain the care and safety of the members. Due to the quick action of the staff on duty at the time of the storm, no one was seriously injured. A few members received very minor injuries from flying debris. Now you think that's not very remarkable, but when I read to you what was damaged, it is amazing to me that our veterans did not get injured in this natural disaster. The Anderson Building, and those of you that know our facility, the Anderson Building is the one right off of Capitol Avenue. It's the low building. Here we have all these three building, you know, three, three story structures, and what happened was the tornado came over and it dipped down and it took off the roof of Pershing Building, which is our three story structure that has the columns, and then it dipped down and it sucked off the whole roof of Anderson Building and blew out all the windows. That building housed 90 residents at the time. 90 people lived in that building and no one was seriously injured. So that is an amazing testament to the, to the staff that immediately um, started emergency uh, precautions when they heard the sirens blow and uh, through their efforts no one was injured. Uh, the, Phys the Phillips Building, World War II Building and Administration Building all needed roof and repairs. Approximately 80% of all of our buildings needed roof replacement or repair. Uh, the storage building and the garage that housed the state cars and the pump house were all completely destroyed. The boiler house and maintenance department also had roof damage. But as in a testament to all of the heroes of that time period, the citizens of Grand Island um, really came together. Utilities were restored at the home on Wednesday evening. So already utilities were up and running there. Um, Although natural gas was restored on Wednesday before noon, the National Guard supplied a generator to man the sewer system and the Colorado Springs supplied a generator which was used to service the World War II Phillips buildings and the kitchen. So hot meals were available on Wednesday evening. So those folks that had suffered through the trauma of Tuesday night by Wednesday night got a hot meal prepared by the dedicated staff of the vet's home. And as far as the grounds are concerned, those of you that have been long time residents of Grand Island know that we used to have a forest on the front of our grounds. And unfortunately, 80% of those trees were demolished by the storm. So the beautiful park that we have now um, really are trees that, that the few that survived that. We essentially had a forest and you couldn't hardly see the veterans home uh, buildings for the forest there on that drive along Capitol Avenue. So um, obviously there's a lot of dedicated folks that, that took care of our veterans. Uh, some of those veterans did, did go on passes or furloughs so that they could be with their families you know, to, to lessen the strain, but we did not have to close the facility and that's a great testament to the, to the dedication of the many uh, volunteers and staff that helped out in that tragedy. Of course, there's been a lot of changes and improvements over the years, many of which occurred recently. You've probably seen or read about our dietary renovation project, and uh, it's really great. They have a brand new dining room called the Liberty Cafe, and they love it, and the system of delivery of meals to the other units is vastly improved with that renovation project, and one of the most important things also is we got physical therapy up out of the dark, dingy, depressing cellar <laughs> and up into the bright, cheery uh, first floor of the World War II building where the old dining room was located. And it's just amazing to see all the people taking advantage of that uh, rehab and wellness center now that it is upstairs. Uh, of course, what's near and dear to my heart are the recreational programs and activities and the volunteer programs that really provide for the quality of life of our veterans at the veterans home. Um, we are all dedicated, no matter what department we, we work in, to help the members rediscover their zest for life. You know, nobody wants to go to a nursing home. Everybody claims they're not going, <laughs> but unfortunately a lot of people need the care that a, a skilled nursing facility can provide. And so it's our job, all of our jobs, whether we're staff or volunteers or just the community of Grand Island, to help those old veterans rediscover a zest for life a meaning and a purpose for why they are still with us because they touch our lives in immeasurable ways that we can't even begin to understand. Um, a lot of people say, well, how can you work there because, you know, people die. You know, I'm like, yes, they do. But, you know, as much as I feel that I can make a difference in their life, 
their legacy lives on in mine. And so that is just a passion for the work that I have to work with those people, those heroes that President Abraham Lincoln gave to our care, to forever care for him who shall have borne the battle. Thank you. I was supposed to talk for about 40 minutes. <laughs> but if you have any questions, I, I would sure entertain a few questions here, and then I know they're going to want to serve some refreshments. So um, any questions? Sure. Now, has the Veterans Home always been under the jurisdiction of the state? Yes. Even though it started here? Right. The, the, sure, the question was, has... has no, right. The, vet, she, the question was, does the Veterans Home always been under the auspices of the state, not under like the city of Grand Island? And yes, it has always, the state has always funded and administered the Veterans Home. Yes. Originally, they wouldn't let the Confederate uh, veterans in the, in the uh, soldiers and sailors. If you weren't a Confederate veteran, you couldn't be there to begin with. And I yes. noticed this little speech that you read that Abraham Lincoln mm -hmm. did. Yes, he did, but I do have a reference to that. Let me see if I can quick find it, because I was trying to um, weed down. His question was, um, originally this was set up for the Union veterans, and that's how it is, is called and what he said, but at one point they did decide to let the Confederate soldiers in. And I'm not finding it here real handy, but I did have a spot in here where it referenced that, where he did go and visit. Here it is. It says, Mr. Lincoln, President Lincoln could not consent to the starvation of rebel prisoners, nor to any approximation to cruel treatment. Retaliation must take some other form, or he would not endorse it. His real sympathy with soldiers in their hardships and perils extended even to the rebel prisoners in our hands. At Frederick, Maryland, he visited a house in which there were a large number of Confederate wounded men. After viewing the scene, he said to them, I should be pleased to take you all by the hand if you have no objections. The solemn obligations which we owe to our country and posterity compel the prosecution of this war. Many of you, no doubt, occupy the attitude of enemies through uncontrollable circumstances. I bear no malice toward you and can take you by the hand with sympathy and good feeling. There was hesitation at first, but it was soon broken, and the Confederates stepped forward to shake the President's hand. Some of the number were too badly wounded to rise. Mr. Lincoln approached them, and taking each one by the hand in turn, remarked, Be of good cheer, boys, and the end will be well. The best of care shall be taken of you. So the state did decide then eventually to allow Confederate soldiers to enter the home. Of course, that created other problems <laughs> because of the drinking and the fighting that went on. But indeed, uh, President Abraham Lincoln really did have compassion for all of the soldiers in this torn country at that time. Yes? Did you hear a tornado warning and then move the people from the Anderson The question was, did we hear the tornado warning and then move the, the people from the different buildings? No, actually, they had on the, the radio and TV, and they heard the reports that there was a tornado, that there was a tornado cell, and that tornadoes were on the ground in northwest Grand Island, out in the, uh, to the west of us. And so the switchboard operator at the time said, you know, we're going to start uh, making sure that the staff know. And so they alerted our staff to the fact that a tornado may hit well before the sirens even went off. So that was amazing. Kim, you probably could answer some of that, huh? Were you there then? Yeah. Was it you? Yeah. Well, see, here we have one of our heroes right in our midst. Stand up. <laughs> Kim could tell us all about that day. <laughs> that could be a whole other program. <laughs> Isn't that correct, that you, you heard... system or whatever.
the dark clouds to the yeah, west. I can see the tornadoes, and I, I told Craig, I said, I'm, I'm following this. I said, and I said, you know, Mr. Bronson, it's time. But I just went ahead, and, and we, you know. So you said D plan in effect, D plan in effect. D plan is what it was. And that. And that, and then that got the nurses and everybody into the effect of just getting the members out of harm's way. Because you can see, and when I looked out, when I went out by the chapel and looked out, I could see the huge tornado, and I just, I knew that we were going to get hit. Actually, head struck. Yeah, I was you know, we were supposed to stay on duty at the switchboard, and I could hear it. You know, I thought I could hear when you talked about the Anderson building, I could hear the Pershing building and the, the trees all blowing out. And finally, we went down to base member Don Fisher. He was one of the members, he was running around, he didn't know what to do, and he was just so upset. And, he, and I finally told him, I said, Get your butt down there! <laughs> <laughs> and after that, you always would see that member. He always had his little, he'd have his little transistor radio and he'd be running around looking out the windows. I think there's a storm coming. I think there's a storm coming. <laughs>